I was born in Anaheim, California. I grew up in a little neighborhood. Uh, it was called Avadio, where uh, most of the people there uh, grew up doing heroin and going to prison. And so at about five years old, my mom and dad uh, decided they wanted to move to a kind of a better part of town so I wouldn't be influenced growing up and get involved in gangs and drugs and all that stuff. And so uh, we got a nice little house in, um, in the east side of Anaheim, California, and um, I ended up having brothers and sisters. There was six of us. My dad was a bricklayer, my mom was just a housewife, and um, man, I had a great childhood. I, I remember it so well, and my dad worked hard, and uh, you know, my mom loved us. Um, and things were going just great in my life. But uh, when I got close to going into um, middle school, junior high school age, just about 12 years old, um, my parents had a lady that helped clean the house. Uh, she was kind of a nanny of sorts. And the next thing you know, I, I walked in the living room and I saw my dad holding hands with this lady one day. And, uh, you know, I was tripping out, but I didn't know exactly what was going on. And then uh, as I started to see the two of them together, I realized that it looked like it was more than just some kind of friendship and that uh, my dad had an attraction towards this woman. And then um, I started hearing my mom and dad argue and one night I can remember hearing my dad grab my mom by the hair and throwing her up against the wall. And uh, that was the beginning of realizing I had a dysfunctional family, that my dad was in love with this other woman and that there was just drama and tension in the house. And I loved my dad so much, I respected him, you know, like he was the greatest guy in the world. And I, I just didn't understand, I was a confused young boy. And, uh, you know, divorce wasn't popular in those days. Divorce was something that you didn't even hear about, talked about it. I was in a nice Anglo neighborhood. I was kind of a, an outcast color-wise. I was a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. Then one day, I remember my dad packing up his stuff, screaming at my mom, and he took off. Took off with this woman, and uh, my mom didn't know how to tell me what was going on, but uh, at 12 years old, I did understand uh, my dad was leaving, and it didn't look like he was coming back. Uh, that's when, um, as I was getting ready to go into junior high school, I realized my whole attitude about life changed. I, I, I'd been hurt. I I'd, uh, I'd felt a wreck, I felt like uh, I was misunderstood and I didn't have anybody to talk to. There was no Jesus, there was no church, there was no God around our house. And I really didn't know who to talk to. So about that time, I got my counsel for some of the older guys down on the corner. And I went down to the local corner and I talked to some of the fellas and told them what was going on in my family. And you know, their advice was, hey, drink this, you know, smoke that, you know. Uh, come and hang out with us. And it was my first indoctrination into uh, getting involved in what people would call a gang or a crew, a group of people that, um, that were looking for love in all the wrong places. And that's uh, how it started with me. Well, here I am going into junior high school now and uh, my family's a wreck. I'm mad at God, mad at everybody in the world. And I start smoking weed and, you know, I'm drinking alcohol. And, um, you know, school, I don't ever remember even taking my books to school. I was pretty, pretty good at taking tests, so I made it through, you know, a couple grades to ninth grade. And, uh, but I was, always, I was always getting arrested, you know, for drunken public, for being under the influence. I was going to juvenile hall all the time. And I can remember my mom, she was always enabling me because she felt guilty, you know, and I always made her feel guilty. You, met, you made my dad leave. It's all your fault why he's gone out of here. So she'd work hard and buy me bicycles, do all this stuff like that and try to, she tried to love me the best she could, but I mean, there was no way. I was on a ramp. I was on a roll. I was mad at this world. I was in rebellion and nothing was going to stop me. But I didn't have any respect for anybody, anything, including myself and just loaded all the time. By the time I got to high school, I barely made it into high school, and while I was there, like I says, I got involved with all these uh, hippie movement that was going on. So next thing you know, man, I'm taking LSD, you know, I'm snorting cocaine. My life was just one big party every single day and night. And I had no goals, no aims, except to party every day and kill the pain. 
It was all about killing the pain. My brothers and sisters, I started seeing them follow my footsteps, you know, and seeing them want to get loaded, seeing them want to do the things that I was doing. I was the older brother. I was supposedly the man of the house, but, you know, I was a wreck, man. I would, like I said, I was so mad at everybody and everything that um, I couldn't see clearly. In high school, there was one good thing that came out of it. I met this girl named Karen, beautiful, blonde hair, blue-eyed young lady. And she was just really good to me. I partied with her and this, that, and like that. But she was like different than all the other girls. She was not only good looking, but she had a good heart. And, um, you know, we dated, we went out. She liked me, I liked her, all that kind of stuff. But I didn't take anybody too serious. And uh, we started dating together real heavy and being real close to each other and intimate with each other. And the next thing I found out a few months later is she's pregnant. Now, back in the 60s, I mean, you get a girl pregnant, it was almost like in conservative Orange County, Southern California. The right thing to do, everybody believed, is you marry that girl. But I wasn't about ready to get married. I wasn't ready to settle down. I didn't understand about love and kids and all that kind of stuff like that. And from my messed up family and my dad gone, I didn't know about being a father. But I, I had this yearning and caring for this, this lady. And when I found out she was pregnant and I married her, we went back to Anaheim, got ourselves a little apartment, and I tried to do the settle down thing in life. It didn't take long, and I was back out partying, you know, I had this beautiful son, a beautiful wife, but I was being unfaithful, I was a mess, I, I just loved hanging out in the bars, I was riding my Harley with my buddies, and we were just having a blast. Um, getting in fights all the time. It was just such an exciting life. And then being home with my wife and kid, you know, as much as I loved my son, as much as I loved my wife, there was no way I wasn't ready to settle down. So here I am, I'm married, and actually I'm miserably married because I wanted to be a dad. I wanted to be different than my dad was to me. I wanted to be a good father. I wanted to be a good husband. But I wasn't done with partying. I wasn't done with hitting the streets. I, that, that nightlife, you know, the, the violence was still in me. Doing drugs was still in me. And um, so I can remember one day, uh, pulled up to the house of my motorcycle, and I told Karen, I got to hit the road. I got to get out of here. I got to, I got to find out what's out there for me. I, got, I, got, I need freedom. I just got to get on my bike and ride. And so I can remember hugging both of them goodbye. And um, that was the end of that marriage. That was the end of uh, my relationship with my son. Once I left my son, my wife, it was on like Donkey Kong. And it was, it was no rules, no nothing. I was going to get even with this whole wide world my dad leaving, my family split up, and now I don't know how to be a dad, I don't know how to be a husband. You know, I was just a whoremonger, I was full of violence. I started training, you know, I loved a street fight, loved a barroom fight, so I started training, getting d disciplined in the martial arts. Next thing you know, man, me and partners of mine, we were out traveling around the country fighting in tournaments people starting to look up to me and all this kind of stuff like that. But underlying time, I always had that partying, that whiskey, that Southern comfort, that having to get drunk and always starting drama here and there. Next thing you know is I'm starting cocaine and here I am like I'm fighting in tournaments, big tournaments around America. And after the tournaments are over, we're snorting up this coke, and got a party house, and got my bike and I'm riding with my partners and it was just one fun lifestyle you know we still we got jobs as bouncers at nightclubs so we could learn how to work our different uh, karate techniques kicking punching people in the head you know do, just doing every kind of wild thing we wanted to do man just going crazy I finally came to a place to where I met this one girl and uh, she asked me one day she goes have you ever tried heroin before and I said, no, man, I would never do heroin. Heroin's for losers, man. I'm into cocaine, big money, drugs, fun, party, and stuff like that. And I can still remember her asking me, let's try it one time. I said, okay, 
I want to try it one time with you, just one time. And I can remember I'd never shot a needle in my arm at that time, and I'd snorted and smoked and drank and stuff like that, but I'd never ever put a needle in my arm. But I can remember that one day when I held my arm out to her, and I says, okay, you know. She pulled out the syringe, cooked up that heroin, she put it in my arm. And the minute that went through my blood ran into my heart, I said, wow, there is nothing I've ever felt like this before. It was like all my problems were gone. There was a peace that was just unreal. And as I started to nod out, I can remember just like it was yesterday, the good, tranquil, wonderful feeling I was. My mind before that was so full of busyness and so full of madness and so full of unrest and depression and just hated my life. And now all of a sudden I found something to calm the storm. The next thing you know is I'm shooting up every day now. I'm, I can't wait to get up in the morning and get some more hair on and just shoot it up. I started losing my bike. I started selling everything. I'd heard how heroin was a monkey on your back. Well, it became a gorilla on my back. It became a monster on my back. I've just become a stone heroin addict. And then I sunk down into stealing from my brothers and my sisters, and my mom, family, stealing their TVs, stealing everything I could. I became a hope to be dope fiend, heroin addict, and didn't care about anybody on this earth. Heroin became the love of my life. I forgot I even had a son, forgot I had a wife, forgot I had a family. I didn't care about anything at all but me and my wonderful lady, heroin. I didn't care what I had to do to get my drugs. I didn't care what I had to steal, who I had to steal from. There were no rules anymore. I can remember going to the drug dealer's house and just robbing them of all their drugs. It didn't even matter. Once I got a hold of heroin, once I became an addict like that, once all that violence and my whole lifestyle had got to that place, I had a reprobate mind. I didn't care about anything or anybody but myself. I've been living that crazy lifestyle of what I thought a one percenter, the biker, hardcore, dope fiend was living. And, um, didn't matter. Nothing mattered anymore. I was, I was so in love with my drugs, so just wanting, I didn't care about anybody or anything. But finally, the party was getting ready to come to an end. The police came to my house. They surrounded the house. I could hear them on the loudspeaker saying, Aguilar, come out with your hands up. I immediately grabbed a hold of my dope, went to the bathroom to flush it down the toilet. They'd been looking for me for a long time, the police, and I knew they were gonna eventually probably get me, but as I was flushing that dope down the toilet, I felt a cold pistol up the side of my temple. And the officer said, Aguilar, you make a move and we'll kill you. I was so messed up at that time. I was so full of violence and hatred in my life, so full of bitterness because of everything that happened in my life that I needed to be locked away. I'd hurt my family, stole from everybody, was violent with anybody I could be, it didn't matter. I was actually happy that they put me away and I was hopefully hoping they'd throw away the key. Here I am now sitting in a prison cell, facing possibly 10 years. My life is a wreck. I hurt everybody I said I loved. I was just, no hope. I was sitting in my cell one day and I heard a man shout out, chapel call. He said, any of you boys want religion, walk on down that hall. Well, I got up out of my cell and I walked down to that little chapel room. I went in there, there was about 30, 40 men in that chapel. And the preacher started to preach about the peace of God that passes all understanding. Now, I was questioning in my mind whether I could receive that peace because uh, of all the sinful, heinous, terrible things that I'd done. And the preacher started to answer those questions. It was like he was just speaking to me. And he said, if any of you men here want to give your life to Jesus Christ, 
stand up right now. That was probably one of the scariest moments of my life. I wanted to stand. I'd, I'd played Let's Make a Deal with God many, many times before. God, if you get me out of this jam, I'll be good and all that stuff. But I never really meant it. And then I found out that day that if, uh, if you mean business with God, He'll mean business with you. I stood up out of my chair. Me and one other fellow stood up. And I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. I committed my life to the Lord Jesus. And fireworks didn't go off, but I knew something happened inside of my heart. I knew there was something going on, and I knew I was serious and I was ready, just like when the cops put that pistol in my head and had me put my hands up. That day, I put my hands up and I surrendered to God, gave my life to Jesus. And uh, the preacher came up and hugged me and the other fellow that gave our lives to Christ. And... Uh, you know, I was still worried because I was going to be spending years with these other inmates and I, I didn't know what the story was behind Christians in prison. I heard about jailhouse religion and I didn't want anybody to think that that was me. I, I wanted people to realize, hey, man, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired and I was ready to give my life to Jesus. So as I left that uh, little chapel room and started walking down the mainline hall, I immediately had somebody come up and said, hey, were you just uh, jiving the preacher or were you serious? Did you actually give your life to Jesus? And something inside of me, I know now that it was the Holy Spirit of God. Something inside of me came in me and I said, yeah, and I'm going to serve him for the rest of my life. And that was my beginning uh, as a newborn Christian, as a disciple in Jesus. I went back to my cell. Someone gave me a Bible. I started cracking it open. I started reading the Word of God and it was just like life to me. All of a sudden I had a desire and a hunger to read God's Word. And I had a hunger to share with people. Nobody had to tell me about it. I, as I, read, I was reading God's Word, I just knew that I was supposed to tell other people. It didn't matter anymore about circumstances, where I was at. It had nothing. I wasn't thinking about getting out, thinking about anything. I was just thinking now about my son and praying for him wherever he was at. I was thinking about those that I loved on the outside, but I'd heard, thinking about telling them about Jesus now. Immediately, my life became transformed and God was doing a whole new thing in my life. And I was excited, not about anything else, but about serving Jesus right where I was at. Because of